that's 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 an easy way if you ever want to know for a speaker to do a mic check there when they say amen like that at the end of, it's just to, to do a mic check so it's really instead of going the other way um thanks you guys for being here today glad, i'm glad that you're here glad that we're able to to come together and worship the lord sing amazing songs glorious day was epic and i just want to say good job worship team thank you for leading us into the throne room this morning it was so good so good um i'm just thrilled by by what is happening when i hear about all the things that are, that are going on all of the kids stuff that's happening our adventure bible camp um and uh camp here we go i was talking with a gentleman this week and uh he was he's got some some young young kids and, and he was going you know i just I'm looking for ways that I can invest in my in my young my, my son, and what can I do to encourage him to build character in him, to help him along the way to becoming a man. And so I was listening to all the things that he was sharing, and and I, I got passionate about this because I'm going, we have some amazing opportunities, not not just for for young boys, but also for for young young girls too. But here's the thing, dads. We have this thing called Camp Here We Go. It's teaching our young men and young women about knife skills, hatchet skills, archery, camping, respecting nature, respecting God, understanding what, what our surroundings are, how God's created all of this. What better opportunity, dads, for you to pour into your kids? What better opportunity? Now, I know that a lot of dads have got to work. We've got to, we've got to you know, bring home the bacon. Amen. I get that, Okay. But who do we know that we can then ask to be a part of our kids' lives to pour in and encourage them to help serve so that we, people that we trust, right? We need to be actively involved. I also feel this way very passionately about our, our, our kids' ministry. This is an opportunity that we have every Sunday, dads, to pour into our young people every Sunday, to work with them, to encourage them build them up, to lift them up, to raise up godly men and women. This, dads, is your opportunity as a Father's Day passionate mm, come on! You gotta hear this. Because I think that we struggle so many times as we grow up and we see our kids growing up and we go, where are the adult male influences in my kid's life? And we say that. And yet how present are we on a Sunday morning? How present are we when we have an opportunity to do something like camp? Here we go. I want to encourage you dads and moms, and I want to encourage young people, young adults right now that may not have a, have a kid right now. This is your opportunity to learn about the amazing young people in this church and to pour into their lives. To love on them just a little bit to say to them, because you know, I know that there are so many kids in our community that don't have a dad, that they don't have a mom, they come from a single home or, or a single parent home, and they need to have somebody that can pour love into them. And this is our opportunity to live out love every Sunday. So, my box now. I just love our kids, and I, and I want to see them grow, and I know that there are so many opportunities, dads, for, for you to pour in and invest. So um, take a week, pray about it. God will say do it, because I know that God is a God that says go and do. Um, but uh, I, I really do feel that, um, you know, I, I know that many of our dads are pouring into their kids, and I think that we can also, dads, pour into other kids' lives. So let's do that. Um, all right off of that. I'm excited for this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to speak to you about something that is uh, a, a secret passion of mine. Um, it's, it's something that I, um, I love and I, and I, and I just uh, I pray about this often. Um, and uh, we, we are talking about miracles overall for the next few weeks. Last week we talked about the, the miracle of, of deliverance. And um, I just want to say that today's um, miracles that we're going we're to discuss uh, is, is something that is, is an interesting topic to talk about. It happens a lot in Scripture, but we don't necessarily say it in this way. We don't necessarily talk a whole lot about healing. 
We do, we do share about the stories, the miraculous stories of Jesus healing, but we don't necessarily pray about the healing in our own lives all that much. But what I want to just ask really quick is uh, how many of you believe that God has the ability to heal someone today? Awesome. Awesome. I mean, we do have this scripture on the side of our, of our building that I, that I point to very, very often about the fact that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm excited that you guys believe this. I'm excited and thrilled that, that you um, uh, feel this way because I would agree with you. In fact, the Gospels are filled with, with what Jesus did in, in healing. There's over 30 different healing miracles with the fact that it's implied that there were hundreds more, more volumes of books that could fill any library over the entire world. I mean, that's how many miraculous things Jesus did while he was here. But just, just to kind of give you an idea, Jesus healed b- the blind. He opened deaf ears. He made the crippled walk. He, he made the leper's uh, skin to be, to be free of, of the disease. He raised the dead. In Acts, here's a crazy one, Paul was preaching... So long, he was in a Bible study and he was sharing so long that a dude was sitting in the window, fell asleep, fell out of the window and died, which I'm so grateful that's never happened here. Uh, I know some of you have fallen asleep because I'm watching. I'm like, it's all right, it's all right. Grace, grace. But nobody thankfully has died in the middle of my sermon. Okay. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, but here it is, this guy, Eutychus, he falls out of the window, dies, Paul goes down to Eutychus, prays over him, and he is risen from the dead. All right? Crazy things like this. There's even a very controversial uh, miracle that happened when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. In fact, um, it, is, it, it could be said then that that's why Peter denied Christ three times when... <laughs> Just kidding. I'm kidding. Kidding. Gosh. I love my, mo- mo- my mother-in-law as I stutter that out. No, she's amazing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There's also a lot of miracles in the Old Testament too. You know, Hannah had a miraculous birth and Elijah raised a boy from the dead. Many, many others that, uh, that we experience and, and read about. Uh, John 14, 12 says, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Even greater. I mean, Jesus was was sending out his 12, and he says, go, make disciples, baptizing them in the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Get out there and do this stuff. And and he gives his anointing to his disciples, who then it it continues to go forward. And I want to just tell you, one of the, the, the coolest things that I've been able to experience was uh, a friend of mine who was also a volunteer in the youth ministry when I was the, the youth pastor, um, he had been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And um, it was a scary time. He was a roommate of mine, and we got to pray over him. And at that moment we prayed over him, nothing, was, nothing happened at, at that moment. But later on that night, he, he started to have a coughing fit. He just coughed and coughed and coughed and coughed and coughed and couldn't stop coughing, couldn't g- stop getting it out of, his, out of his system. Went to the doctor the next day, and the doctor did an examination on his thyroid and saw that the thyroid had completely healed itself and that there was no trace of cancer in his body. Okay? Praise God. Praise God, right? That was amazing. He comes back, and he's this really mellow guy. He's not very energetic. Or he's, not, he's not a spaz like me. And uh, he comes, and he goes... So I went to the doctor. Thyroid cancer's gone. It's pretty cool. Thanks for praying. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Woo! I mean, we, we, we celebrated like crazy. It was, it was awesome to hear. But one of the biggest tensions that we have, and the biggest tensions for many people, is that even when we know he can heal, he doesn't. And that's such a frustrating thing. It can lead to, to, to confusion, it can lead to questions, it can lead to, to doubts. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things, I mean, I prayed, I prayed hard, and nothing happened. What's the deal? God, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? You know, if, if God can, why didn't he? If, if God can heal, you know, I, I prayed, for, prayed for Jill's headaches, and she still has headaches. Why? 
God, are, are, are we still dealing with these headaches? You know, some people are struggling with depression. They, they pray, God, free me of this depression. And they continue to walk down this road struggling with, with this, this stuff in their mind. You know, or, or an addiction. They want healing. They want freedom. Yet they go back to um, the things that they're struggling with. Or, you know, you, you have that sick grandma that you continue to pray for and she doesn't get better. There's such a frustration that we can find in ourselves because it can lead to a place of going, well, maybe, maybe God's not real. Or maybe he's not good or, or he doesn't care. Well, I want to I work through that today a little bit. Because our God heals. He definitely heals. It's something that we we read about. It is something that we have testimonies about. I just shared with you about our God does heal today. But he doesn't heal everyone all the time. In fact, God didn't heal everybody in Scripture either. We read about this in in 2 Timothy 4.20. There's this guy named Trophimus. Trophimus is, is one of eight friends that accompanied Paul on his third missionary journey. And it says, Paul, Paul writes this, he goes, uh, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. I left him there. He was sick, so I just gave up on it. No, I, I don't think he did that. But I think that he just said, you know, I would imagine they prayed for him, prayed for him, prayed for him, prayed over him, anointed him with oil, did all of these things, and Trophimus was still sick. He didn't get better. Now, Paul obviously was, was having to continue on his journey, and so it was probably a very... Uh, sad moment when they had to leave Trophimus there, but they moved on. He did not get better. Also, we read a lot of times, and, and this is one of those, those, those scriptures that talks about, okay, well, Paul says to drink a little wine, so it's, it's cool to drink it. Um, you know, use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness in First Timothy. Paul's telling his, his, his mentee, hey, you're sick. I would imagine that they've prayed over Timothy many times to get better. We pray over individuals. We pray for this stuff, and God doesn't always heal. If you have a headache, take a Tylenol. Paul's saying, hey, Timothy, we, we prayed for you, but, you know, if, with your frequent illness, take some wine. It will make you feel better. Do that. And then, obviously, Paul's thorn, Right? He talked about it over and over. I pleaded to God three different times. And it's not like he just prayed for uh, a half hour on three different days and said, God, heal me. It was one of these contending seasons of prayer that as he was struggling through, he was, he was you know, just walking through this agony of this thorn in his side. Now, we don't necessarily know what the thorn was. It, it could have been any number of things. But the point being that, God, or that Paul was praying that this area in his life would be healed. And it didn't get healed. But what Paul said was, is that, God, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Now, the frustrating thing with this, though, is that not only are we struggling with this in our own hearts, but then we get people coming alongside of us, and they will say at times, well, you know, the reason that you're not getting healed is that there's probably some sort of a sin in your life. You know, or, or you know, there, you just didn't pray the right way. Maybe you didn't pray um, the, what you were supposed to pray. Or, you know, you're just, you're just doing something wrong. Man, that'll get you pretty frustrated, right? A lot of times, people, well-meaning, it's not like they're wanting to say something and be mean to you about it, but they're just, they're unsure. They're unsure. Oftentimes we experience a healing in one way, so we think that there's a a formulaic way that that God heals. But as we look at even the ways that Jesus healed the the blind, he did it a number of different ways, right? One, he spit in the dirt, you know, and he he put the dirt on the guy's eyes. One, he just, you know, he he does different ways of healing people with blindness. So obviously there's no formula to how this works. But it's still a struggle when we don't, see the miraculous happen. So what do we do with a God that we know can and doesn't always do it? What do we do? And at the same time, how do we let our faith grow to continue to ask him for miracles of healing? 
Because after a while, you know, we can contend, we can pray and pray and pray, and if it's nothing's happening, it can be very easy to just give up on, on praying for, for healing in our lives, right? We can just let it go, saying, well, I guess God doesn't do that anymore. So how do we maintain this, this healthy tension, but keep interceding, keep praying, keep seeking the Lord? Well, I want to just share with you that there actually are three reasons that Jesus didn't do miracles. There are three things, three reasons that Jesus didn't do miracles. The first one, Jesus refused to perform miracles to prove himself. In Mark 8, 11, and 12, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Jesus didn't need to prove himself. So he didn't do those miracles in that way. Another way is that Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's ultimate plan, right? Judas betrays Jesus, and this is just a, at the, at the, nearing the end of his life, right before he goes to trial, and uh, Peter, ticked off at the whole situation, pulls out a sword, is going for, going for somebody, I don't know, he was just, you know, fighting, passionate for Jesus, and he cuts off Malchus's ear, all right? Now, Jesus, in this moment, he, he, he did both. He did a miracle, and then he doesn't do a miracle, okay? He reaches down, he goes, yeah, I could almost see Jesus hitting Peter on the back of the head, <laughs> going, all right, somebody find me the ear. And, you know, looking around for the ear, everybody's like, I don't know where it is, you know, it's gross, you know, oh, here it is, you know, and Peter's like, I found it, Jesus, you know. <laughs> Picks up the ear, and he heals Malchus's side of his head, and, and then he says in Matthew 26, 53, don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? And he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? The miracles, Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's ultimate plan. So he refused to prove himself. He didn't need to do that. He'd refused to perform a miracle that interfered with God's plan. And then finally, Jesus didn't do miracles where there was no faith. Jesus didn't do miracles where there wasn't any faith. There was a struggle. You know, he went to his hometown. And he couldn't perform the miracles there um, for, for the reason that they just didn't have the faith. They saw him as, as you know, Joseph's son. Or they saw him as the, the rabbi's pet. You know, as teacher's pet guy knows everything. You know, he's always spouting off something from the Torah. Can you believe him? Man. So anyway, they, they saw him as, as this individual. They didn't see him as the Messiah. They didn't have the faith to see the miraculous take place in their lives. And then Jesus says, or, and then it says in Matthew thirteen fifty eight, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. I want you to know that your faith moves the heart of God. Your faith moves the heart of God. However big, however small, your faith moves the heart of God. In Mark 5, 34, it talks about the woman with the issue of blood, right? She, she could not stop bleeding, and she reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and he says to her, in Mark 5, 34, daughter, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. In Luke 17, 19, the, leper, the, the, the guy with leprosy is crying out, are you willing to be healed? Yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to heal you. And what Jesus says in this moment is, rise and go, your faith has made you well. The blind man screams, have mercy on me, in Mark 10, 52. And Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. You follow what's going on here? Our faith can move the heart of God. And there is just something to be said about when, when somebody's moving in their faith to believe, it, it, it moved Jesus. He was amazed. When it talks about the, the Roman centurion, right, who goes and says, my servant is sick. He's dying. Can you heal him? And, and he says, you know, I've got guys that, that I report to that I can say, if you do it, you do it. Well, I know that, that Jesus, if you just say it now, he'll be healed. And it says in Scripture right there that 
he was, Jesus was amazed. He had not seen such great faith in Israel, in anybody else than this Roman centurion, this Gentile of all people. He got it. Now, I think there's two kinds of wow. There's that kind of wow that Jesus was impressed by, but then there's also the other kind of wow, that hometown not having any faith kind of wow that's, that's really one of, those, one of those more sarcastic things going, kind of going, wow, really? You don't have it? Wow. Wow. It's a little disappointing of a wow. So when it comes to your faith, which are you? Are you the big wow? All caps? Or the little wow? Remember that your faith moves the heart of God. It doesn't matter if you have a big faith, like I said, because even it says that if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. Faith of a mustard seed, itty-bitty amount of faith, you can see the miraculous happen in your life. There's that dad in the Bible that uh, his son couldn't speak. And he kept, the, the, the son kept throwing himself into the fire. And uh, the dad is just distraught. I mean, talking about Father's Day. And when our kids are hurting, we are hurting. When, when our kids are, are suffering, we are just in turmoil, right, dads? And so this dad, being desperate, goes to Jesus and says, I'm, I, I want to do this, and, and talks about that, that Jesus is going, okay, well, do you believe do you believe? Do you have faith? And the dad's saying, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. In Mark 9, 24, it says, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Everything is possible, right? But so often we struggle in this place. We want to believe, but our humanness can get in the way. And these are the times that we can cry out to the Lord and we can say, God, help me in my unbelief. Help me to believe what you are doing. I want to see the miraculous. I believe, I know, I read it. I know you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm struggling through this. I'm contending for my kids. I want to see them healed. I want to see this taking place in, in their lives or in my life. I want this, God, but help me in my unbelief. You know, there are those moments where we struggle with this because we don't see the answered prayer. I remember uh, a number of years ago, we as a church body were praying for, for a guy who was dying of cancer. We fasted, we prayed as a church. I mean, we were, we were contending the, the supernatural. We, we were just, we were, we were storming the gates of heaven, all right? And we were going, Lord, this guy needs to live. He's got two young kids. He's, you know, he's, he's needing to be here for his family. Don't take him. And so we were praying for him, and, and, you know, the Lord took him. He passed away. And it was so hard. It was so hard to, to, to work through. But when asked, does this shake your faith? Does this, does this frustrate you? Well, it, it frustrates me because of the perspective that I have, but my God is bigger than this. And so what I had to come to was, was this, that, that our faith isn't based on what God does, but our faith is based on who God is. All right? Our faith is not based on, who, what, on what God does. Our faith is based on who God is. This is a very important thing. This kind of helps us determine the, the, or helps us work through that tension of when I pray and nothing happens, God, what's going on? It's not about what he does. It's not about what he does. It's who he is. Faith doesn't rest on what God does or doesn't do. It has already been demonstrated. His character has already been demonstrated to us through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that God is good. His character is right there, that he will do everything for us to be restored. Now, I want to just share with you guys something that um, is an interesting thought. It's an interesting thought. When Jesus came to earth, his highest purpose 
Hear this. When Jesus came to earth, his highest purpose was not to heal our bodies. It was to save our souls. All right? So with that in mind, understand, when he came, man, there were so many things that happened, so many transformations, so many miraculous things that took place. But his purpose was not just to do that. His purpose, first and foremost, was to save souls, to seek and to save the lost, right? To set the captives free. His purpose was to save those souls. There was four guys, right? The four guys that had the crippled friend, that they took that guy to see Jesus, they went onto the top of the roof, dug out the roof. I mean, they, they, were, they were the hardcore guys from Silverton, right? I mean, they were, they were the, the, the tough hombres that went up there, and they're like, man, if we can't go through the front door, we're going to go through the roof. And so they got up on the roof, dug it out, and they, they lowered their friend down. And what is it that, he, that Jesus says? His first, the faith of your friends has healed you. And then he says, your sins are forgiven. Now that freaked the Pharisees out more than anything else. Who is this guy that can forgive sins? But Jesus' purpose was to save souls. Then he said, pick up your mat and walk. Okay? So when we work through this stuff in our lives, let's understand that we can have all of these conversations with God. God, you know... you, you heal, you're the same, yesterday, today, and forever. You know, what's all this stuff? I'm praying for healing and all this stuff. And he might be saying to you, my biggest purpose right now is to save your soul. Not to see you healed in this way, physically. Before Jesus healed the body of that, that guy, he forgave his sins. I've got a spoiler alert for you. You know, we talk about spoiler alerts with movie stuff right now. You don't want to read anything about the movies online because they they get to a point where they say spoiler alert. I wanted to share a spoiler alert with you, all right? No matter what, no matter what the healing is physically that you may receive, you're still going to die. This is why... Jesus' purpose was to heal souls because no matter what, unless we are here when Jesus comes back, all right, then we will go. But until that time comes, we will die. We all will die. Lazarus, man, he got a freebie at the first time. (laughs) Jesus called him out, you know, but there comes that second time when he got old and he died. Jesus wasn't around second time physically right there. Okay? to say, come out of the tomb. Lazarus died. In Scripture, no matter who it was that got healed, guess what? They still died. This is why the biggest, highest purpose was to save souls. I believe God can heal. I believe that, that he will heal. But even if he doesn't, I will still have great faith in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because his purpose is bigger than my physical need. And I have to realize that. And when we pray, we shouldn't limit the Lord to physical healing. I want to invite uh, the worship team to come back up or just some music. Um, Don't just limit it to physical. I would encourage you to also pray for spiritual healing. I mean, actually, that is the most miraculous place of healing, right? When the spirit is dead and yet somebody comes to know the Lord and the spirit is awoken in them. This is a miraculous thing that takes place when people give their lives to the Lord. This is something that's very huge. And also, I think that we can pray for those um, who are dealing with emotional wounds in their life, emotional needs, emotional hurt. It says in Psalms 147 verse 3, it says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. It is not just about the physical, it's about the spiritual and emotional in these things. I do believe that Jesus heals. Like he healed then, he heals now. 
I have heard testimonies upon testimonies. We have prayed and we have seen healings. But Jill and I were just in a conference with, with one, of, one of the most prophetic guys I've ever known, and he says that more often than not, when he prays for people to be healed, he doesn't see the healing. It's not to be discouraging. It's to say, keep going. Keep trusting. Keep pressing into the Lord. Keep walking in that faith. Don't give up. Keep contending for those things in the supernatural. And watch what takes place. This morning, I want to do something that, that uh, I really believe is, is a part of this conversation. I believe that we need to have, have some time of prayer for each and every one of us. So this morning, if there is something that, that uh, you know, we can have just a little bit of music, but if we could uh, take a moment, and if you need healing this morning, I'd like you to, to stand up because I'd like to pray for you. In fact, not only would I like to pray for you, but I'd like to have other people pray for you. If you need healing for something today, would you just say, yeah, I need it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Don't be shy. Uh, seriously, let's put our faith in the Lord this morning, right? If you need healing, if you're walking through something and you're struggling and you're needing some sort of healing today, be it, be it a, a, a physical be it an emotional or a spiritual kind of healing, I want you to just stand up and I want you to, to say, God, I believe, but help me in my unbelief today. Awesome. Now I'm going to ask something else. For those of you that are sitting around them, would you take a risk? Would you step up? And would you stand and, and, and if, if you feel comfortable, put, put your hand on them and pray for them pray over them this morning, okay? So if we could get people around all of these individuals that stood up, and we can pray for them this morning. Just lift them up in prayer. Where two or more are gathered in the Father's name, He is in their midst. The presence of God is here. God is here this morning. Let us pray, let us contend in the supernatural, and let's walk in the authority that God has given us as sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's contend in the supernatural for these miraculous healings to take place. Let's go ahead. We believe, God, that you are moving in the lives of these people that have stood up and have asked for prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, would you just move in their lives on the things that they are struggling with physically, spiritually, emotionally? Would you just breathe new life into these things? Would you just begin to remove the stuff Lord, we just pray for, for pain in lower back this morning, that you begin to remove that pain out of the lower back, Father God. That there's a struggle to stand, a struggle to sit because of this pain. So Lord, I just pray that you would begin to remove that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, there's somebody with, with like acid reflux. God, I just pray that you would begin to, to remove and, and restore that stomach. Father, that the things that are going on there, that, that this person is just severely struggling with, with this acid reflux. And so, God, we just pray that you would bring healing this morning in your name. 
In Jesus' name, we just pray for this, God. That you'd restore, bring freedom. Thank you, God. Lord. May it, may it be that we uh, never cease, never cease to contend for the, things of, the, for the things of you. May we continue to pray for healing in this house. May you do the miraculous in this place. As Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, there are big and mighty things that come from that statement. So Lord, we pray heaven on earth. We pray for the freedom that is in heaven down to earth. We pray for the no sickness and no disease in heaven. May it be in this house, may it be on earth, may that freedom come. May your will be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. We cry these things out to you, Lord. We ask for that miraculous healing. We ask for that freedom. And God, ultimately, we thank you. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for the sacrifice that he paid, the price that he paid to set the captives free, to save the souls of each and every one of us. Lord, we love you. We're excited to see what more can take place in this, in, in, this, in this house. What more you will do. As the rains come, may that be like a metaphor of what you are doing in the spirit. That you're quenching, you're, you're, you're releasing something, a, a new life in this place, Lord. A watering that is taking place in the spirit that is going to bring and birth and, and rejuvenate and restore old things that have died. God, the, the, the old passions from you that you have placed in people that, that, that have been kind of, that have fallen away, but Lord, also there's a new thing. There's a new life. It's a new day that you are bringing into this house, and we're excited to be a part of it, and we just lift these things up. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time to come together. We give you it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord this morning. He is good. He is good. Yeah. Well, let's take a little bit of time and let's worship this, this morning and let's finish out this day in, in just singing and, and praising and worshiping this God that we serve and, and the life that we have because of the Lord this morning. Amen? All right, let's do it. Mm -hmm.